Welcome everyone. This presentation is about the trial and error technique you can use in section one of UMAP. Just to help orientate you, uh, this is tutorial three shown here. So as you can see, it's part of the problem solving subsection of section one of the UMAP. Uh, and it's one of four videos I've got about different techniques you can use in problem solving questions. Um, so let's get into it. Just to go through the basics of the technique. Um, so when is it used? It's most commonly used for questions where you're given a bunch of different statements by different people, uh, often some of which are true and some of which are false. So any question which fits that description, uh, almost certainly this will be the best way to approach that. Um, having said that, it can be used for a wide range of other questions, um, particularly those where you, you need to kind of imagine scenarios based on different criteria and different bits of information given to you. So in this presentation, I'll go through both the classic uh, true and false statement style of question, but also a few a few different ones just to show you the, the range you can uh, use this, this technique for. Um, in terms of how it works, basically you just pick one of the multiple choice answers to begin with. I tend to go with A. Um, and you imagine that option A is the correct answer, and you imagine a scenario based on option A being the correct answer. If that scenario is consistent with all of the criteria and conditions given to you by the question, then you can assume that that answer, that option A, is correct. Uh, and if not, then just go down to option B and do the same thing. Imagine option B is the correct answer. Imagine the scenario that would eventuate from that uh, and evaluate that against the conditions given to you in the question. That's, uh, that's basically what the process is. So we'll get started with the first question. Have a read of this one. So let's break down this question. Uh, we can see here that the, the window is actually broken by someone called Jake, um, but the three statements have been given here are by Harry, Harry Isaac, and Luke, who are uh, Jake's friends. And the only condition we've been given about these three statements is that half of the statement is true and half of it is false. So if you look at these statements one by one, you can see that they have two components to them. So with Harry's statement, the first is that the boy had black hair, and the second is that the boy had a hat on. And it's the same for the other two. There's, there's definitely two distinct components. And the condition is one has to be true and one has to be false. So all we have to do with this technique is go through these four multiple choice options uh, and evaluate which one of these fits with these three statements given that each statement has to be half true and half false. Um, it, it's really that, that simple. Um, so I'm gonna begin with option A. So the first step again is, is pick the first, the first answer, option A, and imagine that it's true. So we're imagining that Jake, the person who broke the window, does have brown hair, no hat, and is short. We're imagining that that is actually true at this point. So now we have to evaluate that based on the three statements, given that the condition is the statements have to be half true and half false. So Harry's statement, the boy had black hair and a hat on. So the boy had black hair, well, if we assume that option A is correct, that would be false because option A says that the boy had brown hair, not black. So the first half of Harry's statement we're saying is false. And the second half of the statement that the person had a hat on, well, again, that's inconsistent with option A because here it says that the person didn't have a hat on. So already we can see that option A can't be correct because if this answer, option A, was an accurate description of the person who broke the window, then Harry's statement would be completely false. Uh, and that goes against the condition given to us up here in the stem about the statement being half true, half false. So just like that, option A is incorrect. We just repeat that process of B, C, and D. So with B, the boy had brown hair, a hat on, and was tall. If you look at Harry's statement, well, the boy had black hair is false, but the fact that the boy had a hat on is true insofar as it's consistent with option B. So Harry's statement, assuming option B is correct, is half true, half false, which is what we want. Isaac's statement, the boy didn't have a hat on and was tall. Uh, we can see that uh, the boy had a hat on, so the first half of that is false. But the second half seems to be true because both Isaac and option B agree that the boy was tall. So Isaac's statement is again half true, half false, which is what we want. And just to check with Luke, Luke says the boy had brown hair and was short. Well, option B says that the boy had brown hair, so they agree on the first half. So Luke's first half, well, sorry, the first half of Luke's statement is true, 
assuming option B is correct. Uh, and the second half, that the boy was short, uh, that's false because here in option B it says the boy was tall. So that means that Luke's statement is also half true, half false. Uh, and so overall, each of these three statements by Harry, Isaac and Luke have one true component and one false component if we assume that option B is correct. And given that's the only condition that each statement has to have one true and one false component, we can assume that option B is correct. Um, if you were to go through option C and D and do the same process, which could be good practice, uh, you'd find that for at least one of these statements, if not more, this process would fall down and you would find either a completely true or a completely false statement. So that's that's basically the technique I, I recommend and what I'm referring to by the, the, the guess and check or the trial and error technique. Um, I just find it's a much easier and more targeted way of getting to an answer when you've been given four options here. Um, certainly I used to do it in a way where I just sort of played around with each of the statements and imagined that some part of it was true and some of it was false and just sort of played around and tried to make it all fit together. Um, but it, it was often pretty time consuming. Whereas doing it this way where you begin with the answer and work backwards and just critique it based on the, the, um, the statements given to you is much more targeted and much more efficient, I find. We'll move now to question two. This one is fairly similar to the one before, but there are just a couple of additional components to it that we haven't yet gone through. So if you want to pause the video and have a try at this question using the technique we did in the previous one, then please feel free to. Um, but if you can't quite get to the answer, don't be disheartened because it is a bit more difficult. So with this one we can see the premise is that there are four siblings given at the top here, Peter, Rebecca, Sam and Lauren. Uh, and it says that out of those four, two of them uh, ate some chocolate and therefore two of them didn't. And the parents are trying to find out uh, which two of them are responsible for eating the chocolate. And so they ask each, each sibling one by one to give a statement as to who did it. And we can see these statements down the side here. We can see that each statement is made up of two names that that person is saying uh, give the names of those responsible. That's the basic setup of this question. Now, um, the conditions for this question, the things we have to satisfy, are given below in this paragraph. Uh, you can see that really there's only two. The first is given by the first sentence, which is that uh, it is known that out of the four statements here, one of them has to be a total truth, which means that both the names that person gave are true. They're an accurate representation of who actually took the chocolate. So we have to have one statement which is true, completely true, two of them which are half true, half false, which means two of these statements will give one name each which is correct and one name each which is incorrect. And finally, the last statement out of the four has to be a complete lie, meaning both the names that person gave are inaccurate. So I'm going to just sketch that up now just to make it a bit, bit simpler. Um, so out of, out of these four, I'm going to say we need to have one which is in which both names are true. Two of these have to be, uh, two of these statements have to be half true, half false. So one name is true and one name is false. And one has to be completely false, so or completely untrue. So we'll say false, false. So this can be in any order out of these four statements, but in the end we have to have this satisfied. That's the first condition. Um, the second condition is that last line there. Um, it's very easy to just gloss over that and not think too much of it, but it's actually critically important to this question. So take a minute to read that. Um, basically what it's saying is, I mean, ultimately we're being asked to find which of the siblings told the complete lie. That's the question that we're, we have to answer in the end. Now, what this final line is saying is that assuming one of the guilty siblings is the one who told the complete lie. So what it's saying is the one who told the complete lie out of these four siblings uh, it will be one of the people who actually took the chocolate. So the person who told the complete lie also took the chocolate. So think about what that means. It means that if you took the chocolate, you're guilty, and then you tell a complete lie, the two names you give will be two people other than yourself. Because if you, get, if you dob yourself in, that would be at least partially true. So we're looking, so that, that line there at the end is actually very important. Um, we'll get back to that later, but that's the other condition you have to satisfy. So for now, we've kind of set up this question as much as possible. Um, what we have to do is the same as what we did in question one. Uh, we just go through each of the answers one by one and evaluate them. So I'm going to begin with option A. So I'm going to pretend for a minute that Peter, option A, is the correct answer. 
So given the question is, which of the siblings told the complete lie? I'm going to say that Peter is the one who told the complete lie. So we're going to say Peter's correct, uh, in, insofar as he's the one that told the complete lie. So if that's the case, then this statement up here, that Sam and I did it, is the complete lie. That means that both Sam and Peter are false. So both of the names given are false. So we're imagining a situation now where Sam and Peter didn't do it, and therefore the people who did do it must be Rebecca and Lauren. So I'll say that again. If this statement here by Peter is completely false, that means that the two names he gave are the people who actually didn't do it in real life. And therefore the two remaining people, which are Rebecca and Lauren, who weren't mentioned here, are the ones who actually did it. So I'll write up here in the circle, Rebecca and Lauren. These are the two people who we're assuming at this point actually did it. With that in mind, we have to now go through the remaining three statements and critique them based on this assumption, based on the assumption that Rebecca and Lauren did it, and see how accurate these statements are. So we can see that with Rebecca's statement that Peter and Lauren did it, that's half true, half false, because Peter didn't do it based on what we did here. But Lauren did do it. We can see that Lauren was one of the two people who took the chocolate. Uh, keep going through. Sam's statement, Rebecca and I did it. Again, Rebecca, that's true, because Rebecca is one of the two that took the chocolate. But Sam isn't, so that's a, that's a lie. That's false. And final statement, by Lauren, Peter and Rebecca did it. Again, Peter, that's false. But Rebecca, that's true. So what we have here is a complete lie, because we've got two false statements at the top. But the remaining three statements are all half true, half false. We can see that uh, that doesn't quite fit the main condition or the first condition that we have here, that we need to have uh, one complete truth, uh, which we don't have anywhere out of the four statements. So what that means is our, our starting point here, which was that Peter's statement is the one that is completely false, that can't be the case because we've just shown that it doesn't make sense with all the other statements given. So that means that you can cross out option A. It can't be Peter who told the complete lie. And with the remaining working, you can also get rid of that because that's now no good to us. That's just the process we have to go through for the remaining names. Um, it's, it's pretty much the same from there. So give it a go with Rebecca. Um, I'll go through it with you again. So let's imagine now for a minute that it's actually Rebecca that is the one or that is the correct answer, which means that it's Rebecca who is telling the complete lie. So we're saying now that Rebecca is the one telling the complete lie, so I'll write false next to the two names she gives. And if those two names are false, Peter and Lauren, that means that the two people who actually did it are Rebecca and Sam. So we're imagining now a situation where the two people who actually took the chocolate in real life are Rebecca and Sam. So go through the statements again and just evaluate them based on, based on that. So Peter, Sam and I did it. Well, Sam, true. Peter, false. Um, I'll just make that a bit clearer there. That's a false. Rebecca's statement is both false because we did, it, did, that, did that before, sorry. That's the assumption that the whole thing we're, we're working on now. Sam's statement, Rebecca and I did it. Well, that's true for Rebecca and also for Sam. That's a completely true statement. And Lauren's statement, Peter and Rebecca did it. Uh, Peter, that's false, but Rebecca, that's true. So we can see now we've got uh, one completely true statement in what Sam said one completely false statement in what Rebecca said, and the other two, Peter and Lauren, gave half true, half false statements. So that does actually fit what we have here, the requirements here. So that, that's, that's all good. Um, it satisfies the first condition. The only other thing we need to make sure it fits is the second condition, which is the one I mentioned before, this final line here about assuming one of the guilty siblings is the one who told a complete lie. So we just have to make sure that uh, this situation fits with that as well. So the sibling telling the complete lie in this situation is Rebecca. Um, and the assumption we have to make is that one of the guilty siblings is the one who told the complete lie. So in other words, Rebecca is guilty in this situation. She actually is one of the people who took the chocolate. Um, now, if that was the case, if she took the chocolate and then she said a complete lie, the two names she would give are both names of other people other than herself. And as we can see here, uh, Rebecca's statement gives to other people apart from herself. And so that also fits, that, that fits the second condition given by this sentence. So that's also satisfied. And given both of the conditions we have 
are satisfied, you can say with confidence that option B, Rebecca, is correct. Just to help further illustrate this point, um, if we were to evaluate option C, um, so just give me a minute, I'll, I'll erase everything else now. But let's say we, were, we wanted to check option C using the same process. So we're now saying that the person telling the complete lie is Sam. So Sam's statement here is completely false. Both Rebecca and Sam are false, false names. What that means is Peter and Lauren are the ones who actually did it. So imagine a scenario where Peter and Lauren are the ones who actually took the chocolate. Again, go through the statements and evaluate them. If we did that, the top one would be uh, half true, half false, because this would be false, that would be true. Rebecca's statement would be completely true. Uh, Sam's statement we know is completely false. Lauren's statement would again be half true, half false. So this option also satisfies our first condition, that's okay. We can see that what we have here on the left fits the condition we've been given here. But the second condition about, again, this final line about one of the guilty siblings being the one who told the complete lie, that doesn't fit with Sam. Because if Sam is the one telling the complete lie, she wouldn't give her own name. So that's why option C can't be right, even though it fits this first condition, because it falls down at the second condition. Uh, and that's why you can say with confidence that B is the answer. Um, if you want to practice this technique again, have a go at option D and just go through that same process. It's, it's all good practice. Um, but for this one, you can see that Rebecca, option B, is the answer. Um, there are a couple of shortcuts to this question too. I'll just quickly go through. Um, one is that you can see with that final line about um, one of the guilty siblings being the one uh, who told the complete lie. If you think about that, what it means is the person who is telling the complete lie, which ultimately is what we're being asked to find out, they're never going to give their own name, as I mentioned before because that would defeat the purpose of telling a complete lie. So what that means is immediately in this question, you can cut out options A and C, or sorry, you can cut out Peter and Sam in terms of the person telling the complete lie, because neither Peter nor Sam could tell a complete lie given they're giving their own name in the statements. So already you're down to 50-50 just from reading this, this line at the bottom. That's the importance of reading carefully. Um, I guess the other shortcut, if you think about it, is that um, if you, if you know you have to have one statement which is completely true and one statement that's completely false out of these four statements, um, the, the kind of logical jump you have to make, or you can make, is that uh, for, if you pick any one of these statements and say that it's the complete truth or the complete lie, there should be another statement given by a different sibling which gives the two names that the first person hasn't used. So in other words, if we just pick a random Peter statement, that Sam and I did it, and we say that this is the complete truth, then there should be, out of the remaining three statements, one which gives the other two names, which would be, in this case, uh, Rebecca and Lauren. But as you can see, none of the three statements give both Rebecca and Lauren. So given that's the case, Peter's statement can't be the complete truth, or for that matter, the complete lie, because there should be an opposite statement. So that's the other shortcut you can use to quite quickly cut out options. Um, and using those two shortcuts, you could quite easily get to the answer of B, but it does require a bit of uh, a bit of a jump, and uh, it's pretty tough to do it on the spot under the under the pressure of the exam. But I thought I'd just go through that because it's another quick way of doing it. Um, but the technique we went through before also works beautifully, so option B is correct. Question three now. Um, again, it, it's similar in that it's another question where we have a few different statements given by a few different people. Uh, and some of them are true, some of them are false. So similar kind of style. Uh, and again, the same technique we used in the first two questions is the perfect technique for this one. So we'll go through that now. Uh, and the first step, as you know, is to imagine that option A is the correct answer. So I'm going to just imagine for a minute that option A is correct. And so if option A is correct, that means that both John and Percy's statements are true. So we'll put a T next to John's statement and also next to Percy's. Um, immediately though, you can see that there's a problem because John and Percy's statements are the complete opposite of each other. One, one saying that David is telling the truth, one saying that he tells lies. So immediately you can see that's wrong. And we can cross out option A because that obviously can't be true. 
there's a good lesson in that, which is that even if you can't get to the answer for a particular question, pretty often you'll be able to rule out at least one, if not two answers, just because they're so obviously wrong, or they just sound wrong. So even if you can't get to the answer, always look to see if you can rule out options, because ultimately it's just a, a game of odds, uh, and the more options you cut out, the better your odds are. Um, we'll keep going, well I'll get rid of the, the two truths here, and we'll keep moving to option B. So option B is saying that Sally's statement can be true. Um, what I want you to notice with this one is the wording. Her statement can be true. It doesn't need to be true. It isn't always true, but it, it's saying it can be true. So if we can show that there's even one situation or one set of circumstances where what she's saying could be true, then option B is correct. So already it's, it's sounding pretty good. Um, so let's do that. We'll make Sally's statement true in this situation, and we'll try to make all the other statements fit around that with no contradictions. So if Sally's statement is true, uh, that means that you actually can't believe what Percy says. And so all you need to do is follow the trail of the, the information. So if this is true, that means that what, per what Percy says must be false. Because Sally is truthful and she's saying that you can't believe what Percy says. So Percy's saying something false. If that's the case, then what Percy's saying is untrue. So that means that David in real life actually tells lies, he's also telling false statements. Now you can see that David isn't mentioned here, or insofar as he doesn't give a statement of his own, um, but we better put David down here, just a D, uh, and then we'll put false. So, because that, that is still relevant to the overall question, even though he doesn't give a statement, there is still information you can, about him all the way through. You can see David, David, David. So we have to, we have to put something about him down the bottom. Um, now, if what David says is false, then that makes John's statement true, because that's exactly what John is saying, so we'll put true there. And that just leaves us with one final statement by Vanessa, which is that you can't believe what David says, but you can believe what Sally says. So there's two different parts to this bit, or to this statement. Um, the first bit is that you can't believe what David says, and that seems to be true, because we can see here David tells lies, so that's accurate. The second half is that you can believe what Sally says. And we can see again, that's in keeping with what we've got, because Sally tells the truth. So both half, halves of this are accurate. That means that Vanessa's statement is overall completely true. And just like that, you can see that if we imagine the first three statements are true and the last two are false, then that all fits together. There's no contradictions, there's no inconsistencies. That's all, all fine. All the conditions are met, and we have Sally telling the truth in all of this. So Sally's statement can indeed be true, which means that option B is the correct answer. Uh, I'll just get rid of that, that tick there because it's a bit confusing. Um, now, while I've got this up, um, you can see that just from this working here, you can cross out both option C and option D because C is saying that Sally and Vanessa's statements can't both be true, and yet we've got a situation here where they are both true. Uh, and option D is saying Vanessa's statement can't be true, and yet we've got a situation here where it is. So from this one set of working, you can actually cross out both C and D, um, which is very useful. So again, the, the trick to learn there is just have an awareness of the different answers um, and the working that you've got, just to see if there is a, a quicker way of going about a question. Um, in this particular question, it didn't matter too much because we found that B was the answer pretty quickly. Um, but it, say if, if these final three options were jumbled up and the correct answer was actually D. Um, if you went through and evaluated them all individually, you'd be doing the same working again and again when you only need to do it once. So just keep an eye out for that. Um, but you can see the answer in this case is, is B. Question four. Um, I guess the first thing to say about this is you can see this question is a bit different to the first three uh, in that the first three questions dealt with people giving statements, some of which were true and some of which were false. Uh, in this question, everything you see is true. So even though the, uh, the questions I've seen so far, the true lie questions, are the classic style for which the trial and error technique can be used, um, the trial and error technique can be used for a much wider range of questions than just that. So that's really the point of going through this question and the next one, um, questions four and five. They just show the scope of questions that, that can be attacked using the, the trial and error technique. Um, that said, it's the same process as, as what we've done so far. So in this question, we've got three brothers. Uh, two of them are playing a game of tennis against each other. 
which means that one of them isn't playing. And we get given three dot points here, which relate to both the height and the age of the various brothers. Uh, and, this, and we can say with certainty that all three of them are true. So there's no more truth lie business. It's, everything you see is true. Um, the process to solve it is the same as what we've done before. So begin by reading the question, who is not playing in the match, and assume that, just for a minute, that option A is the correct answer. So I'm going to put a little tick next to option A and say that Tom was the one who was not playing in the match. Now the second step is to imagine the situation that would result from that. So if Tom is not playing in the match, that means that Brad and Pete must be playing in the game. So I'm going to put a B and a P here, just to say that in this scenario we're imagining, it's Brad and Pete who are playing the game of tennis. Now the final step is just to go through the dot points and to see if they can all fit together in a way where there's no contradictions or no inconsistencies. Uh, and given the information they're dealing with here is height and age, I'm going to write up two columns, one for height. Uh, and I'll, I'll just write T at the top for tall down to S for short, so we don't get confused. And another one here for age, so A for age, from oldest at the top down to youngest. So we're going to just list the three brothers in order of height and age based on the information given in the dot points. And hopefully there's no inconsistencies. And if that's the case, then our initial assumption that A is correct is actually correct. That's the process we'll go through, just the same as the, the previous three questions. So let's go through the dot points. I think they're actually the most difficult part of this particular question. The way they're worded is quite, quite slippery. So we'll begin with the first one um, and just take a minute to, to go through it in your head and, and process it. First dot point says the taller of Tom and Pete is the younger of the players. So... I think there are two things you can take from this, one relating to height and one relating to age. The bit about height is at the start, which is that the taller of Tom and Pete is the younger of the players. So I would rephrase this as the taller of Tom and Pete is just one of the players in the game of tennis. So I'll say that again, that the taller of Tom and Pete is one of the people playing in the game of tennis. That's, that's the way I would reword it. Now out of Tom and Pete, we can see here that in this scenario, only Pete is playing in the game. So what that means is you can say that the taller of Tom and Pete must be Pete if he is one of the players. So I'm going to put down here in the height column uh, P for Pete and then a bit lower down T. Because we know from this first bit that Pete is taller than Tom. Now the second half is saying that um, the taller of Tom and Pete, which we've already established is Pete, is the younger of the players. So be careful with the wording. The younger of the players is referring to Brad and Pete. They're the two players. So the taller of Tom and Pete, which is Pete, is the younger of the players. That means that Pete is younger than Brad. So I'm going to put P there for Pete and then B above for Brad. And so we're going to just slowly build up our, our two columns based on the remaining dot points. And, and like I said before, just keep an eye out for any inconsistencies. So first dot point's done. Second dot point, very similar. The shorter of Tom and Brad is the older of the players. So in other words, the shorter of Tom and Brad is one of the players. And given out of Tom and Brad, the only one playing in the game is Brad, that means Brad has to be the shorter of Tom and Brad. So in the height column, uh, I'm going to put B below T, because Brad is shorter than Tom. And you can see at this point, I've already completed the height column. Um, the second half of that second dot point is that uh, the shorter of Tom and Brad, which we know is Brad, is the older of the players. So Brad is the older of the players who are playing, which means that Brad is older than Pete. Now that is in keeping with what we have here already, because we've got here Brad is above Pete. Brad is older than Pete. So that's all good. So two, two dot points down and everything so far is fitting in with each other. Just the third dot point now, which is the younger of Brad and Pete is the shorter of the players. Same process again. The younger of Brad and Pete is one of the players. So the younger of Brad and Pete well, in this case, actually, Brad and Pete are both playing in the game, and we already have a lot of information. So we might just be able to read off, uh, read through through the dot point and read off our two columns and see if it's consistent. So the younger of Brad and Pete, which we know is Pete, is the shorter of the players. So Pete is the shorter, it, Pete is shorter than Brad, is what it's saying. But unfortunately, if we go to our height column, you can see that Pete is actually taller than Brad. So I'll just go through that again. The younger of Brad and Pete which we know from our column here is Pete, is the shorter of the players. So Pete is shorter than Brad, 
but unfortunately in our column we can see that Pete is taller than Brad. So this third dot point doesn't fit with the other two. The information we get from all three doesn't fit together. And that means that our initial assumption that Tom is the one not playing is untrue, which means that option A can't be correct. So that's the process we go through for each, each multiple choice answer. We can see if ruled out A, um, I'll just get rid, of, get rid of the writing again, and we'll go through option B. Um, it's, it's similar from there, and it may seem quite time consuming, but keep in mind you'll probably have three or four questions based on this initial stem. Uh, so you can take your time sketching this up. Okay, same process again. We're going to evaluate option B this time though. So, so Pete, let's imagine for a minute that Pete is the correct answer. Therefore, he's the one not playing in the match. So we'll imagine a game which is between the other two brothers, which are Tom and Brad. So I'll write T for Tom and B for Brad. And it's the same process again. I'm going to write up two columns, uh, one for height, one for age. And we're going to go through the dot points and try and make everything fit together nicely. So first dot point, the taller of Tom and Pete is the younger of the players. Again, I would rethink this as the taller of Tom and Pete is playing in the game. And given out of Tom and Pete, only Tom is playing in this game. That means that out of those two, Tom must be the taller one. So Tom is taller than Pete. Um, I'll write that down here. I'll put T above, oh, sorry, that should be a P. So T above P, Tom above Pete in terms of height. Now the second half of the first stop point is saying that um, the taller of Tom and Pete, which we know already is Tom, is the younger of the two players in the game, which means that Tom must be younger than Brad, who's the other player in the game. That's what we've got at this point. Um, I would skip over the second dot point for now. We've done the first one. The second one's a bit tricky because it's asking us to know a lot about who's the shorter and who's the older of Tom and Brad, and we don't really have that much information at this point. Uh, whereas the third dot point deals with Brad and Pete, only one of whom is in the game, so that makes it a bit, a bit easier. So I'm going to go to the third dot point. Um, now, the younger of Brad and Pete is one of the players in the game. Again, given Brad's the one in the game, that means that Brad is the younger out of Brad and Pete. So go to the age. Uh, Brad is younger than Pete, so we'll put a P just above B. And I've just gone against what I told you before about leaving lots of space between the letters. Uh, but down here we now have P, B, T. And the second half of the final dot point is that the younger of Brad and Pete, which we know is Brad, is the shorter of the two players. So that means that Tom is taller than Brad. Um, so I'm going to just put that there. Because at this point, we don't know if Brad is taller or shorter than Pete. All we know is that Brad is shorter than Tom. So that, that could. So I'm going to put them on the same level there. Um, now, the final dot point, the shorter of Tom and Brad is the older of the players. So this, we can just read off our table now because we've got all three names for both, both columns. The shorter of Tom and Brad, so have a look who that is, uh, under height column, the shorter of Tom and Brad is Brad. So it's saying Brad is the older of the two players, uh, and the two players are Brad and Tom. And that seems to fit because the shorter of Tom and Brad, which is, we can see here, Brad, is the shorter, uh, sorry, is the older of the players. And that's true because Brad's here and the other player, Tom, is lower down, which means younger. And so you can see that this information all fits together. And if we imagine uh, a situation where Tom and Brad are the ones playing the game and the brothers' heights and ages are as below, all three of these dot points should fit. They all make sense together without any inconsistency or any contradiction. And for that reason, our initial assumption that Pete is the one not playing the match is the correct answer. So B is, B is the correct answer. I'll just quickly go through C, um, just to illustrate again how, how a wrong answer will appear if you use this technique. Um, so I'll be a bit more selective with what I erase here. I'll just get rid of the names from here. Um, and again, you'll have plenty of time if you get a question like this. They, they understand that it takes a while to to get through it all, so don't be too worried about, about time. Okay, let's imagine now, just to uh, just to humor you, that C is actually the correct answer, even though we know that it's it's actually B. So if Brad's the correct answer, the two players are Tom and Pete. Okay, same process. Uh, I would skip over the first dot point because again, it includes both Tom and Pete, and we don't quite know anything about them yet. 
Um, second dot point, the shorter of Tom and Brad is one of the players. So that would be Tom, given Tom's the one out of the two who is playing in the game. So Tom is shorter than Brad. So I'm going to put a T there and a B above. Um, and the shorter of those two, which we know is Tom, is the older of the players. So Tom goes above Pete. Third dot point, the younger of Brad and Pete is playing in the game. That must be Pete. So that means Pete is younger than Brad. So under age, uh, I'm going to put Brad again, just at the same level as Tom, because we don't know if Brad fits in, in here or in there. But all we know is he's somewhere above Pete. Uh, so I might just rub that out to make it less confusing. Okay. Um, second half of the final dot point. The younger of Brad and Pete, which we know is Pete, is the shorter of these two players. So Pete is shorter than Tom. So we can put that down there. And again, we've got all three brothers in both columns. So that's good. We have to evaluate with our final dot point, which is the first one. Um, the taller of Tom and Pete. So have a look at who that is. Uh, under height, the taller of Tom and Pete is Tom. So Tom is the younger of these two players. Well, unfortunately, that's not true because we can see here that Tom is definitely above Pete and they're the two who are playing in the game. So that goes against the information we've got here from the previous two dot points. Uh, and just like with option A, that's why option C is wrong because there's that inconsistency. Uh, and again, that's, that's why option B is correct for this question. Final question now, and the main reason I've included it is again just to illustrate the range of questions which you can use this technique for, that being the, uh, the trial and error technique. So you can see this question is nothing like the previous ones with truth and lie statements. Um, it's really quite different. But again, by going through the, the answers in that targeted approach, it's much quicker and much more efficient. So this question involves three buckets labeled A, B, and C with those capacities up here respectively. Uh, and we're given that the initial state of each bucket, which is that bucket B is full and the others are empty. And we're told that there are three steps which involve transfer of water between the buckets. Uh, in such a way that in the end, we end up with just the one liter of water in bucket B. The unknown is step two, and that's what we have to find out. So I would begin this kind of question just by visualizing the system. So I'm gonna draw up three buckets, uh, A, B, and C. I'll just write that in there, A, B, and C. And we know the capacity is two of two, five, and three respectively. So I'll write two, five, and three. Um, we also know the initial state of each bucket. So it says bucket B is full, whereas A and C are empty. So I'll just write a line here which represents their initial states in terms of how full they are of water in terms of liters. So zero, five, zero. Uh, and we also know after the first step, which I'll just write in here as well, that um, bucket A is filled to its capacity from the water in bucket B with the remaining water staying in B. So that's our first step here. So what that means is bucket B will pour its water into A until A is completely filled up. So after that happens, we'll have the full two liter capacity in A. Uh, so we'll have the full two liters in that, that bucket. B will then have only three liters because it will have lost two and we'll have zero still in bucket C. Now the second step is what gets tricky because we don't know that. Um, but again, rather than just guessing wildly and playing around with it, go through the answers because at least then you're, I mean, you're still guessing and checking. You're still using the trial and error method, but you've only got the four possibilities that you can work through, so it's much quicker. Um, if we go with option A, it involves transferring water from C to A. Well, if we did that, if you imagine pouring C into, uh, into A, it wouldn't really do anything because there's no water in bucket C for one thing, and also bucket A is already filled to capacity. So we'd end up with the same situation here of uh, two, three, and zero. And then if we then went to the third step, which you can see here is actually the same as the first, it's just pouring B into A. We wouldn't be able to pour B into A because A is already at capacity. So we'd end up again with just two, three, and zero after our third step, which I'll just write in here to illustrate. So if we did this, we'd end up with two, three, and zero again, which goes against our, really the only condition we have in this, this question, which is that bucket B must contain one liter of water. So it can't be option A, that just doesn't work because we end up with three liters, not one. Um, I'll just rub this out and we'll go through the other options. So that's why A can't be correct. If we go and look at B, 
bucket C is filled using the water in bucket B. Well, this is at least possible because we can see that at this stage, if we poured B into C, we would end up with uh, still two in bucket A because we haven't touched bucket A, but B would be empty because the remaining three liters here would all be poured into C. So we'd have two, zero, and then three. But at this stage, we run into a problem because if we then went to the third step, which again is pouring B into A, we can see there's nothing in bucket B and you're looking to pour out of it. So there's no way you could end up with one liter of water in B after pouring out an empty bucket. So that's why B would also be wrong. And again, I'll just drop this out. Um, option C, similar problem to, to A in that bucket B is filled using the water in bucket C. Um, so at this stage, remember, we're going back to just after the first step. If we tried to fill bucket B with the water in bucket C, it wouldn't do anything because there's no water in bucket C at this point. We've got zero liters. So again, this, this wouldn't work. We'd end up with the same, the same numbers, two, three, and zero respectively. And it would just be the same as option A. We'd end up without the whole way down. So C is, C is out too. Option D, bucket C is filled using water in, in the bucket A. So let's imagine this now. Um, bucket C is filled using the water in bucket A. So the two liters here, which we've got here, would be poured into bucket C. So now bucket C has two liters, uh, A has nothing left, and B we haven't touched, so it's still got three liters there. So this is the state of the game after two, after the second step. And if we now implement the third step, which is pouring B into A, well, we could do that again because B has three liters in it, and A is empty, so you could pour two liters out of B into A before A reaches its capacity of two liters. So A would fill up to two. And then you'd be left with just the one in bucket B and the two in C. Uh, and that's why D would be correct, because you can see at the end here, we've got the one liter in bucket B, which is what our main condition is here. And that's why option D would be correct. That's it for this video. Um, hopefully you've seen the scope of questions you could use this trial and error technique with. Uh, I think it's just one tool to keep in mind when you're going through section one, along with the other ones presented in the other videos in this series. Um, but hopefully that helped.